So good afternoon all. Uh, happy to see that most people from our team in Hedernag Oncology are here. Uh, as uh, we are well aware, we run a very busy service. It's always a little bit difficult to find time at the end of the day when sort of everything is piling up on you, but good to see that everybody's made it. So we have Terry from our, uh, from our team, our pathologist colleague, colleague from radiation, colleague from medical oncology, and we shall do the introductions after the lecture now that time's going on. So let me introduce you to Professor Terry Jones. Welcome, Dr. Patnagar, ma'am. Dr. Patnagar is chief of NCI, and Dr. Dev is the chief of surgical oncology. So just to go on again, Professor Terry Jones is visiting us as uh, Infosys professor in oncology. We had uh, nominated him for this position uh, in the newly instituted such uh, professorship, traveling professorship at AIMS, and very happy to note that uh, with his CV as it was, uh, not no great surprise that he was sort of uh, selected to be that. We are starting his visit with us uh, today. He's come down from Liverpool to be with us. Professor Jones is a professor of head and neck oncology at the Liverpool Cancer Center. He's also director of the Clatterbridge uh, Cancer Center, the director for innovation, and he also leads uh, the, the 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 England and the UK collaboration on genetic testing for the head and neck group. So the, uh, uh, Dr. Tra Jones has been uh, a colleague from a fair length of time, a long, long while away ago when I used to train there. And of course, we have kept in touch. He has, uh, he has done his medical schooling uh, in a rather unconventional way, I would say. He finished school, uh, worked. Uh, worked uh, after school for a couple of years, then went on to do a degree in microbiology, microbiology man, <laughs> doing research from microbiology, <laughs> and then uh, uh, then elected to come to medicine. So of course, uh, if you come to medicine by this route, then you have a lot of other inputs or knowledge that come your way, and I think that's what has helped him make the progress he has. He has elected to, to be in the NHS, but to take on an academic position in the NHS rather than be a fully practicing consultant. So he was initially senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool and then a full professor in the University of Liverpool. Um, so Professor Jones, thank you for making the time, the time in th which sort of comes to fair time in a couple of weeks which he has chosen to spend with us. We hope to use this time to, to to, to see on, on, on avenues where we can move forward with collaboration to get to know each of those departments a little bit better. Um, and today, as introduction, he's going to tell us as to what they have achieved in their quest for moving on towards personalized oncology in head and neck. So Professor Jones, please. Thank you, Professor Packer. Uh, for that very kind introduction. It's difficult for me to convey to you how honored I feel to be talking to you today, um, not only to be awarded the emphasis chair in oncology, but also to um, be invited to spend some time here in, 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 in New Delhi uh, with Dr. Packer, who, as, as he says, we've known each other for a, for a wee while, and we were reflecting yesterday that none of us probably, neither of us probably expected to be doing this sort of thing 20 or 25 years on. So it gives me massive pleasure to, to, to be here and thank you all for taking the time uh, to come and listen to this uh, this afternoon. I'm extremely grateful. So my brief was to talk to you about how we might approach a personalized, um, take a personalized approach to treating patients with head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer is um, a, a challenging undertaking it's a challenging specialty and so what I hope to do is to walk you through why that might be reasonable to start thinking about a personalized approach and how because of the technological approaches that have become available to us in the last very short amount of time how that might be uh, a thing on the horizon that we might be able to bring into routine uh, clinical practice so I have no disclosures so um, and I realize I have a mixed audience, so for, for those in head and neck, please bear with me, but I think some of the original arguments is really important here. So when uh, I and Dr. Thacker trained, and, and you guys in India trained, um, it, it, it's still seeing your practice, um, head and neck cancer was, was um, 
relatively straightforward in terms of its etiology. Unless you um, had uh, or partook of tobacco, whether that was smokeless or smoke tobacco, uh, and drank and or drank alcohol, you probably weren't going to get head and neck cancer. And then um, throughout my training, towards the tail end of my training, um, we were seeing an increased amount of cancers of the tonsil and the base of tongue. And we sort of didn't think too much of it first, but the only difference was it, that the patient group who were coming to see us were very, very different to the patient group that we were seeing with mutagenesis, carcinogenesis induced cancer. These, this patient group were younger, fitter, often more affluent. They smoke nothing or they smoke far less and they certainly drank less alcohol than their counterparts with traditional head and neck effectors. So it suddenly became evident that there was something very strange happening here. And this was happening in a developed world across Northern Europe in, in the US as well. And some very clever people started to think that there was something strange. And ultimately what we've come to is realizing that the etiology of that disease, and it's a new disease entity, is human papillomavirus, particularly genotype 16 in, in the head and neck. So the story doesn't finish there. We had this new disease entity presenting in different different patient group, but actually even stranger than that is, it, is its clinical presentation. So typically with traditional head and neck cancer, you had a primary tumor that would present somewhere in your upper area digestive tract, and you'd have lymph nodes associated with it, but it would usually be that the T stage, the primary tumor would, the, would be the large thing, and, the, and apart from the small group of patients, the N stage would be smaller. This was reversed in this disease. You often had very small primary tumors, but patients would present often with a lump in the neck, a sizable lump in the neck, multiple lumps in the neck. And even more than that, up to 30 or 40% of these individuals, when you looked at their lymph nodes in the neck pathologically, would have extra nodal extension. The cancer would have extended outside the capsule of the lymph node. And so all of those features in traditional head and neck cancer were um, features, really poor prognostic features. They were harbingers of doom. If you had extra capsular spread and big nodes, you were doomed to do really badly from your cancer. Whereas in this disease group, you actually do better for reasons that we don't understand. So there's a whole difference, not only in the patient group that present with this, but the biology of what's actually going on in this disease that actually makes it fascinating. So we're left with this situation to get into the point of the slide, is that we now know there's a definitive discrimination between patients with head and, uh, HPV negative head and neck cancer who, despite our best efforts over decades, we've not managed to improve the overall survival uh, outcomes at all. Whereas in this HPV positive disease, for reasons that I just explained to you, those patients um, do far, far better from their disease. However, apart from in this group here, there's probably 10 or 15% of patients who still do badly from their disease. And those patients can't be identified pre-treatment or on diagnosis as things stand. So everybody gets the same treatment. We're in the situation that this, even with this new disease, this HPV positive disease that's coming up, they still very much treat it in exactly the same way as HPV negative disease, despite the fact that we know the outcomes are better. So we're in this very interesting paradox situation is that for patients with HPV negative disease, we're still trying to find novel treatments that actually improve overall, overall survival. Whereas actually in the context of HPV positive disease, we've actually got patients, we're looking for novel treatments that actually turn down the treatment intensity to maintain the survival outcomes, but improve the functional outcomes because whatever we do in the head and neck has a consequence one way or another. So that's the conundrum that we start from. So when we grew up and these patients started emerging, what we actually had was big open head and neck surgery. Head and neck surgery has always been big and open. And we used to spend a lot of our time doing lip split mandibulotomy procedures. And you can appreciate that from the gory slide I put up there that you've done a lot of damage to the patient before you even get to the tonsil. And then you have to reconstruct the free flap. So the surgery was challenging, demanding, exciting. Um, and we thought we were doing lots and lots of really good surgery, but actually in truth, we could be doing an awful lot better for our patients than actually doing it. It was curing them, but there must be better ways of doing it. 
So at the time, and evolving through this, was the story in the, in the non-surgical world around uh, cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And uh, the oncologists, were, the radiation oncologists were using cisplatin-based chemotherapy in the context of head and neck. Uh, and it was becoming with high quality evidence, not least this huge meta-analysis that's been renewed on several occasions, that suggests in treating head and neck cancer, if you have a background treatment of radiation and you add in cisplatin, you will confer a survival advantage to your patients. And typically, if you look at this across the board by treating patients with cisplatin in their chemotherapy, you will confer a, a survival advantage of about 6.5%. So this became, particularly in this disease of oropharynx cancer, the standard of care treatment. Um, so you can see this graph that shows that over this period of time from the late 90s, what we saw was a massive escalation in treatment with chemoradiotherapy in non-surgical treatments and a concomitant decrease in, in surgical or radiation alone treatments. And that's probably not surprising in light of that. It then tipped even further towards um, chemoradiotherapy because the oncologists got far, far better in targeting the radiation. Intensity modulated radiation was a paradigm shift in delivering radiotherapy rather than big parallel opposed field radiation with the functional consequences of that. And even more level one evidence that if you take these, these um, uh, um, structure sparing approaches, these partial structure improvements, it works. So a colleague of mine and a good friend of mine uh, did this phase one clinical trial, Chris Nutting his name is, when they spared the contralateral parotid and patient um, quality of life and xerostomia was far, far better after that treatment of disease. So it looked like we were, in, and it was accepted across large, large swathes of the, of, of the, um, of the world that uh, chemoradiotherapy was the way to go for this disease to the point that everybody thought surgery had no role in it. There were a few of us um, in the background um, deciding that the big open surgery that I showed you previously was probably not the way to go and that if we were going to have surgery in the treatment paradigm of this disease we needed to do something different. And so some of us became persuaded that um, transoral laser surgery was the best way to, have, uh, to deal with this. Uh, for reasons I'll come to in a second, whereas um, in America particularly, transall robotic surgery was being pioneered for the use in the treatment of head and neck cancers. Um, and we've got um, lots now, significant series, retrospective series, showing that this might actually be effective. And obviously the one I'm going to talk to you about is our own um, update of our own cohort of patients. Um, where we actually uh, treated 264 patients with uh, transloral laser microsurgery. I want to move away from lasers versus robot. The idea is the philosophy of how you do this. If you do use a robot, the teaching is that you do a standardized operation irrespective of what the tumor is. With a transloral laser approach, it's nothing to do with the laser. It's actually all to do with the microscope that you can see um, the tumor with increased precision is that what you can actually do then is that you can actually do a bespoke operation, an operation that's tailored by the tumor, not by the structures that you're operating within. And the idea then is to preserve normal tissue beyond the tumor to improve the functional outcome of the patient. So we, did, we treated these patients essentially with uh, transoral laser microsurgery, but the microsurgical philosophy. And despite them having um, a significant number of what would be seen as adverse um, pathological features, so margins less than one millimeter and extra nodal extension in the neck, they still had post-operative radiotherapy because that's what our oncologists were wedded to. And so this was highly contentious at the time and, and we were becoming criticized for it, but what we showed in this group of patients, which were a mixed group of patients, two thirds were HPV positive and one third was HPV negative, that our survival outcomes were as good as anything that was being seen for patients with HPV positive disease. So survival, as I showed you on that first graph, um, which were very good for HPV positive disease and not good for HPV negative <coughs> disease. But that graph looks exactly the same as the first one I showed you. And the, and the data are actually quite startling. So we've got an overall survival rate of, of the high 70s, and that's as good as what you see with non-surgical treatments, and local regional control rates of 92% at three years. And what we are showed, like everybody else, that if you have HPV positive disease, your chances of survival is significantly more likely than if you've got HPV 
negative disease. So that proved that we weren't doing anything stupid. We weren't disadvantaging patients by taking this approach. It doesn't prove that everybody should be doing it, but we, we weren't disadvantaging patients. But where the real advantage potentially came was in the functional outcome, because by, fire, by treating patients like this, if you look at their swallowing outcome, and a surrogate of that would be their use of a feeding tube at one year post-treatment, then you can see in comparison to the green group, which were patients who had the big open surgery that I showed you before, and parallel opposed field radiation, and the purple group, which were patients who had chemoradiotherapy with parallel opposed radiation, and the yellow group, which were patients who had chemoradiotherapy with intensity modulated radiation, you can see that an approach that uses transall laser microsurgery plus radiation alone actually appears to confer a significant swallowing advantage to those patients. So not only was there evidence that we weren't causing patients disadvantage, there was increasing evidence that we might actually be causing patients an advantage in terms of their swallowing function. And other data, particularly from Joe Patterson in Newcastle, has showed that also to be the case. So in contrast to the graph I showed you a, a few slides ago where we were seeing a massive uh, decrease in surgical approach to this, what we're seeing since uh, the late end of 2008, when, particularly when transal robotic surgery was licensed for use by the FDA in America, we're seeing a reversal of that trend where surgery is used far more for, um, for treatment of this, this disease. But we still have a problem. This is talking about um, groups of patients, patients with HPV positive disease, and it doesn't help us at all when we actually have one patient in front of us as to how do we identify which patient is going to do well, which patient is going to do badly, and how do we tailor that treatment. I'm employed to get clinical trial data uh, together, but in truth, clinical trial data doesn't help us at all in that sort of situation, particularly when we're taken into toxicity accounts. So how can we personalize it anymore? So the truth of the matter is that there's nothing more personal to all of us than our own g genome, our own genetic makeup. And if we then talk about the tumor, there's nothing more personal to that tumor than the genomic makeup of that tumor. So the holy grail then is to try and devise individualized or personalized treatment highly predicated to that individual. And it might be prognostic or it might be um, um, predictive. So where this began to change was, um, was in America when they undertook the Human Genome Project, in, and that was published in uh, 2003, so a long time ago now. But you'll see from the writing under this, 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 this actually ended up taking um, 13 years to do, to, to, to sequence one human genome. So impractical in real terms, but it paved the way as to why the, how this technology might be used in, in, in medicine in its whole. So then the NCI went and funded the Cancer Genome Atlas Network, and this was a, um, uh, an endeavor, as I said, run by the NCI, where um, um, clinicians were uh, in, um, invited to, to submit tumor blocks, which would then undergo exome sequencing as part of this whole genome sequencing. And this has been a vast um, reservoir of, of omics data to allow us to understand what, uh, what underpins uh, head and neck cancer and you can see just i won't go into any detail but there are there are genetic differences between hpv positive and hpv uh, um, uh, negative disease which is what you'd expect and it's bound to be underpinning the difference that we see in in the in the treatment outcomes so following up on that in in the uk um uh, david cameron who was our then uh, Prime Minister in 2012 formed a company, what was called the Genomics England, and the idea was to, to sequence, to, to use sequencing technology, to, use, to sequence 100,000 genomes, either in rare disease and or in cancer. And uh, that would be taken from about 70,000 people because you've got to take a germline de de um, sequence and in cancer, germline and a comparator from the tumour. So the idea was to finish that off by 2019, um, which is what actually happened. And the idea was, as well as trying to understand some of this personalized approach to medicine, was in the UK to create a genomics medicine service that could be rolled out to in, into our socialized healthcare system. Um, in Genomics England, in, in contrast to the, to the 
TCGA, they took a, um, a decision to do a whole genome sequencing. So that's not just the coding sequences of the genetic code, it's actually the intra, it, it's the non-coding regions as well, because it's likely that there's a lot of information in there that might be helpful to do what we, what we want to do. So the way this looked was, on, on a, and it was systemized across the whole of our NHS, is that patients who were undergoing cancer surgery will stick to cancer surgery. Any tissue, if they were consented appropriately, but any tissue that was in excess of the requirements for their diagnosis were eligible to be used for the whole genome sequence project. So those t that tissue would then go off and, and be sequenced as part of a, a national industry, if you like. So the real ambition here in Genomics England was identified in this slide. So the idea would be in the left-hand side here, you can see that that would be the DNA extraction. It would then be sent off to a central repository in Cambridge for sequencing. And that those sequencing data would be married to major clinical data sets that would have been collected nationally um, around life course data, around tumor data, around patient demographics. And those two things would be put together and they would create um, what would be called a research data infrastructure. And it's that that could be accessed by researchers then to try and understand some of the, some of the issues that were uh, going on in this disease uh, in an attempt to understand it on the one hand, but also to tailor and improve treatments in another. So we formed, uh, and I lead the head and neck, what's called the Genomics Clinical, Inter 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 Genomic Clinical Inter Interpretation Partnership, or the GSIP. I don't know why they chose that name. They could have chosen a simpler name. But this is the, the, the repository to do all of that in head and neck cancer, and it's, it's a pan-UK thing. And when we developed this, we defined umpteen aims, but, but the main ones for the purpose of today is to develop personalized treatment approach to inform treatment selection and prognostication and to identify novel therapeutic targets, potentially around drug repurposing, um, or biomarkers of outcome and stratification for treatments response. So that's the way we set this up. And we set it up in this way, exactly it's a mirror image of the slide I showed you before, data extraction, sorry, um, DNA extraction, which can be married to appropriate data, and from that we can ask the questions that are relevant to our specialty to attempt to do what we've been talking about. As part of this, the structure is set up to train the next um, uh, group of head and neck, academic head and neck surgeons. It's to train scientists in bioinformatics because this isn't a precise uh, field, as many of you will know. And so our original, so we looked at our initial cohort of 160 patients. Um, we had 355 patients that we put in uh, to start with. And we've looked at a cohort of 160 of squamous cell carcinoma because when we put the tumors in originally, it was, everything was allowed to go in. And what we actually, got, we in Liverpool um, donated the most. And there's a couple of headline findings from that. The first one and the reassuring one is that our data analysis was very, very similar to the data analysis that was seen in the, in the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And that's highly reassuring that when you're collecting um, similar tumors from across the world that the analysis is exactly the same. So that was reassuring. But there's one thing I want you to look at in that top slide over there. The tumor suppressor gene TP53, which is a hugely important gene in the development of head and neck cancer. And if you have a mutation in it, you can see that about 60% of patients, both in the TCGA and the Genomics England, is mutated. Those tumors have mutations in them. And it's felt to be one of the biggest drivers in the development of at least HPV-negative head and neck cancer. When you look at P53 status a little bit more, so P53 is normally um, in its wild type state or its normal state. And the way it works is that if the cell is put under stress, then P53 is activated and it either takes the cell off into a cell kill pathway, into an ap apoptosis pathway so it can be killed, or it takes it into a DNA repair pathway. Um, so it's really, really important for us not to have cancer, to have an intact P53. If you have a mutated P53, there are two things that can happen. You can either have a mutation that damages its function a little bit, that's a non-disruptive mutation, or you can have a complete disruptive mutation where its activity is destroyed. And if you look at these data analysis taken into account whether the P53 is wild type, disruptive or not disruptive, you actually see very clearly there a risk stratification. Patients with wild type P53, tumors with wild type P53 do best. Patients with 
disrupted, i.e. non-functional P53, do worse, and there's an interim strategic uh, pathway in between uh, where you have non-disruptive uh, mutations and those patients do an intermediate stage better. But again, when we collect just any tumour of any patient being um, being treated and you put it into something like the genomics, the GSIP, the head and neck GSIP, it still doesn't give us the answer to our question. And then we need to put it into much more meaningful, bigger clinical trials. So this is a clinical trial that I run with a clinical oncologist in, in Cardiff called Mararid Evans. And this has been recruited across the world now since 2015. This trial is called the PATHOS trial, and it's designed to include patients who have HPV positive oral pharynx cancer, for whom the decision is that they would have transoral surgery, that could be transoral laser surgery or transoral robotic surgery, and a neck dissection. Following that initial treatment and a pathological assessment, patients are stratified into three risk groups. They're either stratified into a high risk group, group C, where they actually either have a surgical margin of less than one millimeter and or extra nodal extension in their, in their tumor in the neck. Or um, to, uh, so that that's, gets them into a high risk group, extremely low risk patients where they require no adjuvant treatment. Uh, they, put, they get put into group A. And then there's an intermediate risk group of patients who don't have those risk factors but will need adjuvant treatment. And then the central question of the trial is in both the intermediate immediate risk group and the high risk group, can you de-intensify treatment um, and is that safe to do so? So in the high-risk group, patients would should be treated with chemoradiotherapy. That's three modalities of treatment. That's surgery, cisplatin, and radiation. And arguably, that's too much. So the randomization in that would treat patients with surgery and either CRT, chemoradiotherapy, or radiation alone. And in the intermediate risk group B, um, the convention treatment, the standard of care treatment would be 60 gray and 30 fractions. And the de-intensification experimental arm is down to 50 gray and 25 fractions. And in both cases, it, the question is, can we answer that? By doing that, is it safe? And does it confer a survival advantage, Many, much like the retrospective data I showed you previously? As I've told you, we're open across the world. We're in um, 34 or 38 UK sites and 15 international sites, including the US, Australia, France, and Germany. And we've got other sites opening to come along. And this requires huge numbers of patients. So we've already put in excess of 805 patients into this clinical trial and randomized uh, roughly um, um, uh, 480 patients. Uh, and that will tell us the answer to that question. But the reason and the pertinence to this um, talk is that we also got the bioresource uh, um, as part of this trial funded as well. So for every patient who's entered into this trial, they get bloods taken uh, pre-treatment, after surgery, pre-radiation treatment, and then at various time points out to two years after treatment. And we also have the ethical approval to take up to five biopsies from the primary site and two biopsies from the associated lymph node site. And it's only by having tissue bioresources like that allied to the technological advantages around sequencing that we're likely to prize open some of these the answers to the question that we've been talking about thus far. And so we plan on a five full work stream uh, program of translational work called Pathos Trans. And central to that is twofold rel relevant to this is the, the molecular profiling of the tumor phenotypes, risk stratification, personalized medicine. And we will try and do the same with circulating tumor DNA as well. So unless you put all of those three things together, the clinical problem, the uh, meaningful clinical trial, and the uh, sequencing technology, you're probably not in a chance of actually getting through uh, to a much more personalized way of managing these patients. In addition to that, that P53 story I told you about where you get that split out in, into P53, um, we have a thing in the UK that says, um, despite the fact we have no evidence as to why you should do it, we will fund uh, measuring P53 mutations in this thing called the National Test Directory. And there's not a shred of evidence for it happening in, in head and neck cancer. And you wonder somehow are those de decisions have been made. So we plan a national cohort to assess just that. So every patient, the aspiration <coughs> is that if every patient who's treated with head and neck cancer gets a tissue uh, biopsy that we can sequence, we can then bring this into real life. 
Uh, that needs lots of money, uh, lots of uh, patience to be able to do that, but it also gets us down that track. And it's one of the reasons that um, Dr. Uh, Professor Thacker and I have been chatting about is, can we do that sort of, can we take that sort of approach across two continents to, to start answering those questions in a much more wider, more global setting? So changing tack completely, when I set up the Liverpool can Head I, Neck... Can I ask you, sir, can, can we have a little small discussion here? See, P53, you know, HPV, E6 will also degrade P53. Yes, exactly. And there's a mutation. So in both cases, if we go by sort of molecular logic, P53 is inactivated. So and yet there seems to be a difference. There is definitely a difference, and that's um, something I don't uh, yet have an answer to at all, but that's counterintuitive. Um, possibly for after, um, that um, P53 story I'm, I was talking to you about is for HPV-negative patients only because we don't know what's happening in that, in that HPV-positive disease, and the likelihood is that in the, in what we're seeing is the vast majority of HPV-positive disease has wild-type P53 as well. Um, so there's a different story going on there. Yeah, I mean, my thing is that you'd expect E6 to inactivate P53 in yes. HPV, so which apparently is not happening. There. No, I think it is happening. It just isn't related to a P. You have to have a wild type P53 to be able to do that. So there's no necessity for that tumor to have a P. Of a for HPV positive. For HPV positives. Yeah, yeah. Yes of P53, yes. you would expect to be non-functional because of the virus. Exactly. So that, that that's one that's, of the theories, is that that's why those tumors are developing. In, yeah, okay. Okay. So changing tack a little bit more, when I set up the Liverpool Head and Neck Centre, there was a, 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 um, a significant investment from the University of Liverpool to allow us to do this. And one of the things that, because we put the infrastructure together as to how we manage patients with head and neck cancer, uh, and we'd set up our ability to do early phase clinical trials led by surgeons, we were allowed to recruit, or we were able to recruit some extremely impressive individuals. And the two up on the right-hand side of that slide, the one on the left-hand side is Professor Christian Ottensmeyer, who is a world leader in tumor immunology. And he was in working in Southampton on the south coast of the UK, and we managed to persuade him to come to Liverpool. And um, he, he and I had been working for a, a number of years with um, uh, Professor Vijay Pandurangan, who is working currently in the La Jolla Institute of uh, Immunology and Allergy in San Diego. And these guys are extremely bright and, and extremely well versed in what they would do. So the way our endeavor works is that we put surgery and medicine together with um, people who know this subject inside out. And it so happens that immunotherapy is now coming into, into, in, into its own. So what they and others, and particularly a guy called Gareth Thomas in Southampton as well, had demonstrated that if you had any head and neck tumor, and the density of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes was high, patients would do better. And if you had um, head and neck cancer and the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte density was low, patients would do less well. And that's what's actually been demonstrated by this graph. And the bigger that cohort got, gets, the tighter that correlation becomes. So the question is, is how much is a tumor infiltrating lymphocyte density acting on uh, tumor outcome and therefore survival behavior. And what uh, we did, we, we've collected tissue, in, and this was done by uh, Christian and, and Vijay, is that we've done transcriptomic analysis. So that's taking it one step further. That's not just DNA analysis, that's extracting RNA to understand which genes are being expressed in that tumor. And these are whole tumor aggregates. And what we've found is across this in tumor, until low, we see a, um, a lower expression of immune-related genes in contrast to the TIL high, where you actually see a higher expression of TIL-related genes. And specifically, genes that are related to the activity of PD-1 therapy or program death, ligand and program death lig ligand 1 therapy. And so where we're going into the aspects of current-day immunotherapy. And so what you are immediately left with is a hypothesis that actually says, if you have patients with TIL low, who are low immune, um, immune uh, pathway expressors, that those patients would respond early. 
uh, uh, would relapse early and that they wouldn't respond to anti-PD-1 therapy. And co the correlate of that is that if you have patients who are high uh, expressors, that they're likely to relapse late. But if they did relapse, you'd anticipate that they would be uh, responsive to, uh, immuno uh, to immunotherapeutic strategies. Now, if you take this one step further um, of separating out T cell populations, there are things that are t t um, resident memory T cells are particularly pertinent. So that it's be believed, and many of you will know this, that these are cells that reside exactly where they've first been provoked by an antigen, which may have a specific relevance when it comes to virally induced tumors, for example. So if you look at tail high and tail low tumors, what you've actually found is that you get um, differences in these tissue resident memory cells. And there's one particularly that we actually found which was interfering gamma signaling, and it's a, it's a CD8 cell, um, which has, uh, basically explains, it's got a gain of function of CD103, which is the ligand marker that actually identifies it. And if you drill into that population more, what you find is that they actually express uh, genes that are highly, that literally result in proteins that are highly cytotoxic. And it's therefore not surprised. So that shows you the, the evidence that they're highly cytotoxic when you actually look at these in more detail. And it's not surprising that if you look at these tumors, so you take layers off, take another layer, and you look at the CD103 populations in tumors, and if they're high expressors or high, if they have high densities of CD103, uh, CD8 cells compared to low density CD8, CD103 cells, then there will be a difference in outcome. So what I'm painting a picture here is actually going from gross and macro down to increasingly taking layers off the onion to understand these tumors more and therefore to get into a particular post that, place that we can start really personalizing treatment. And so it lends up with all of these research questions. Can we actually find and can we find surrogates and markers of good and poor outcome and which, 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 which actually molecules, whether they're there or whether they're not there, actually predict uh, poor outcome or not. And when you start playing in the immunology space in tumors, one of the major problems, in fact, the central problem you've got is deciding which tumor antigen, tumor associated antigen, is actually the most relevant. And it probably differs from tumor to tumor, even though the tumor is emanating from the same site. And these could be virally induced in the case of EBV or HPV viruses, but it could actually be a whole plethora of things. And unless you really start knowing what that tumor antigen is, how can you possibly target it and how can you possibly make it personal? So again, Christian and uh, Vijay Pandurangan together with uh, ourselves designed this clinical trial with a company called Transgene. And this is um, designed for, um, it's a phase one study uh, with locally advanced HPV negative uh, tumors. And the idea was to do a, a phase one proof of principle trial in, in all commas, HPV negative disease. And this is to develop personalized vaccines. So the way this works is that patients come in with their tumor and they have a biopsy of their tumor. At the same time, they have a blood uh, sample taken. From the blood sample, we get germline DNA. From the tumor sample, we can get tumor DNA, but we can get transcriptomic uh, analysis of the tumor to see which of the, which of the genes within the tumor are actually are being expressed. And by doing a very fancy bioinformatic subtraction process of the genes in the germline versus what's being expressed, you can then do a predictive algorithm of the most likely tumor-associated ant antigens being expressed by that tumor. So transgene then go away with that information, develop that information, create genetic inserts that express those most highly expressed tumor-associated antigens, and create an MVA vector vaccine that that patient can have back if or when they relapse their own personalized uh, vaccine related to that tumor. And the trial design is, as you show, so patients get standard of care treatment, they have the biopsy taken, it's sent away for the, for the uh, analysis and, and vaccine construction that I spoke to you about and in, to, in a randomization. Some patients are vaccinated at various time points after their treatment, whereas the other group are only vaccinated in the time of recurrence and the idea would be to test effectiveness and safety in these patients and to see if the vaccine is, is efficacious in preventing recurrence in some of these high-risk patients. So putting all of this together, um, what I hope 
um, I've convinced you is that if I did, if you needed convinced at all, is that the development of personalised approaches is going to be key to the way that we move this forward. And unless we put clinical information, clinical um, problem defining issues together with high quality bio resources as well as cutting edge technology together, we're simply not going to answer some of these questions. Large scale randomised control trials are critical in generating well level one evidence, and I've spent my life doing that, but they won't take us any much further or any further to answering this personalized qu question. I think it's a persuasive argument that there's nothing more personal than our genetic data, either our own or our tumor's genetic data, so that has to be at least a reasonable place to start looking. Bioresources and clinical data are critical to answering any of these questions, which is the conversation we'll be having later this week. And. Um, you know, at least my view on this, well, this is a really exciting area for future development and, and let's watch this space to see where we get to. I need to thank lots of people because all of this is a big endeavour. The people who help us set up the laser um, um, practice in Liverpool, huge number of people have allowed that to happen. The patients who allow Pathos, the clinical trial, to happen, particularly my colleague and friend, Mererid Evans, who, without whom none of this would happen. Um, the guys at the GSIP, who've uh, allowed us to put this together. And I'm working with some very, very bright young, uh, young um, talent who um, are just a joy to work with. Um, and they'll take this to place it. Andrew Shackey, who's a colleague of mine who will lead on this, uh, this P53 cohort that I spoke to you about. And these two gentlemen who are driving uh, us in a direction I never ever anticipated we would be going. Uh, and it only came about by marrying the various parts of our organization together. Thank you very much. So lovely, Professor Jones, thank you. And uh, I was just surprised to find uh, that we as surgeons who started out as, as you said, who sort of looked at tumors at the gross level, have uh, developed some proficiency in peeling the layers of the onion, as you put it, and, uh, and understand a little bit more. Um, we had moved on from gross to pathology, and from pathology, we're now moving on to genomics. And I was uh, very pleasantly surprised to find that when Professor Sinha asked uh, very difficult question. I not only understood the question, but I also understood the answer. So I thought I had moved on to quite a distance. <laughs> yes. So, nah, great. But if there are other questions, uh, uh, thoughts uh, uh, that we uh, may interact with, uh, Professor Jones, sir. It, mm -hmm. They present with uh, locally advanced head and neck cancer. And so the tumor size is extremely large, often more than four to five centimeter. And there's a significant component of hypoxia in these tumors. And hypoxia is bad, it portends radiation resistance as well as chemotherapy resistance because of acidic microenvironment. So in your opinion, what would be the good biomarkers of hypoxia? and what would be the good uh, imagings to capture hypoxia and what are the mitigation pathways to circumvent the adverse uh, prognostic effect of hypoxia? So um, the first question that comes blows my cover completely. Um, so not only did we talk about a complexity that's taken us into a molecular pathway, the bit that we haven't touched on but is a, is a personal, personal interest of mine, is intratumor heterogeneity. And where that becomes relevant is that if we're going to base all of these decisions off um, a biopsy without taking a tumor out, we have to be really clear that that biopsy is representative of what else is going on in that tumor. And you've already taken another layer off the heterogeneity because there will be hypoxic areas and non-hypoxic areas, but there'll be areas in which there'll be particular mutants with radio resistance or chemo resistance and not as the case may be. So I think that's the next stumbling block that we're going to come to is, is what we, we, we might develop gross biomarkers from, from, from one biopsy, 
But the next thing we have to address then at um, taking it forward is to take into account the um, the heterogeneity, it's particularly around um, hypoxia. That there are obviously gene sets, that nine, nine gene signatures that have been developed from colleagues of mine in the north of England and Manchester and others that are going through validation techniques at the moment. But they're going to run into the same problems of heterogeneity um, before we can really start inducing that, in, in, introducing that into, into routine standard of care. So a challenge. Um, one of the reasons we picked on P53 at the minute is that when we look across P53, if you have a P53 tumour, it, it looks to be a really early event. And so that it's pervasive across the tumour, you lose quite a bit of that tumour heterogeneity. It, it seems to be a homogeneous event. But there will be others that happen further down the line in that clonal development or clonal selection thing, which will not lend themselves to be biomarkers. What I'm not clear is where hypoxia fits into that. Um, in that terminal ag uh, algorithm, and actually how it differs from HPV to HPV positive to HPV negative tumours. Yeah, HPV positive tumours, for example, um, are arguably highly hypoxic um, because of the necrotic cause, and yet they still do better for treatment. Um, and that then lends itself to another conundrum. I'm, I'm proving what I said to the um, the colleagues in ENT that I uh, the junior colleagues that I spoke to last evening when I said. Um, whatever we have a discussion throughout this week, um, it's very rare that you'll get an answer from me because because I don't know any. Um, but what you do is you take the layers of the onion off. You you just realise there are more and more questions. So thank you very much for your answer and. Yeah. So just uh, my last and uh, the second question, in fact, this is regarding the use of anti-EGA for monoclonal antibody in HP positive porphyrangeal squamous cell carcinoma, which has come out to be uh, like negative trials in uh, large multicentric state um, settings, the de-escalate trial, the RTOG trial, as well as the TROC trial. Now we know based on the TCGA data that EGFR is not strongly expressed in such tumors. So. Uh, should we have done more homework before embarking upon this kind of uh, trials, or is it easy to be wiser in hindsight? I guess it depends on your perspective. So when the de-escalate de trial was being developed in uh, the UK, which is the same as the 1016 trial that was developed in the US, and for those who, this was a, a, a randomization trial in patients with HP, with P16 positive disease, where they either got um, uh, radiotherapy with cisplatin or radiotherapy with, with cetuximab, the, the EGFR blockade mechanism. Um, I argued the case in the, in the trial development group that the molecular evidence wasn't robust enough because of the inverse relationship between EGFR expression and HPV positivity. And that view wasn't carried at the time. But ultimately, the trial proved negative. Both trials proved negative. In fact, proved disadvantage, disadvantageous to take that view, uh, th that route with cetuximab. I think there are two answers to it. Either it was really the wrong answer, and and the and the, 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 the you know the molecular underpinning didn't make sense, or it could be that heterogeneity aspect again is that you actually flatten out if you if you're having a targeted treatment. And the um, EGFR expression of your tumor is not homogeneous. You might actually get that wrong. Um, a, a significant amount of this. So I don't know the answer to that question. But there are multiple ways where that could have been um, an erroneous trial design. So I suppose there's two questions. You can actually ask the pertinent questions up front and not do the trial. And that could be wrong. But the definitive way to answer that question is to do the trial and ultimately prove that it's wrong. So a small comment, by, by this time you might be knowing that in contrast to the Western world, our 80% orophangeal tumors are P16 negative. Yeah, and a question, so ultimate uh, personalized care, what we feel in oncology, which is usually nowadays a common practice uh, upcoming in the liquid malignancy or hematological malignancy is CAR T cell. Any comment about that in head and neck cancer? 
two things. We, we were having a conversation last night is that when it comes to HPV positive disease, there's, there's even, I mean, there's lots of conundrums about it, but one of the things is the geographical both variation, both at local and global setting. So we discussed those data last evening at dinner, and, and that's not borne out in the UK population, for example, where we're seeing in our local population up to 70% of oropharynx cancer patients are HPV positive. I've, I can't remember the last time I've seen an HPV negative uh, case. So there's another question. I haven't got an answer, but but why is why is that actually uh, why is that actually the case? I don't know the answer to that. And sorry, your second question was about the CAR T cell. Ah, CAR T cells. Yeah. So we're, I've had conversations with Christian Ottensmeyer about this. So where we're at in it, there are probably areas that you might think of using it, but his view, and it's not my view. Um, in conversation with our hemato-oncologist colleagues, is that the toxicity of the technique is probably of a of an extent, and I'm talking in a very uninformed setting, that it doesn't demand our use of it at the minute. There's two things. We don't know what to target, and, and actually are there external ways without doing a, a, a CAR-T manipulation, because we haven't got stemness in this, um, as far as we know. We might have stemness in an HPV-positive setting, so I think it's one of those things we need to keep there, but I think we're probably a significant away, way away from it yet because of all of these factors. What do we target? How do we target it? Why are we targeting it? And then we have to take into account that we're going to induce um, a, a, to a currently toxic treatment into a patient group who currently do very well. So for all of those things, uh, I, I'm not sure where it fits at the minute. Hi, Professor Jones. Thank you very much for wonderful information. So I absolutely right with, agree with you that heterogeneity is a major factor. Could you think like PIF3 is a, have the uh, guardian of genome and that is mutated, which increases the genomic instability. So how that DNA methylation, which is a on the base of we are now classified the cancer on the their phenotypes on the base of DNA methylation, you think how epigenetic map or methylation patterns help in the personality treatment? Magic finger. Um, it's another level of complexity that's that's highly important. Um, just slightly taking it tangentially, but coming back to a question that was asked in in the context of HPV. Uh, a, sorry, P53 in the context of HPV disease. So if you think that through, and it's been said today that one of the central events that we think, and it's probably correct, is that E6 overexpression takes out. Um, P53 causes the increased ubiquitilation of P53. And a similar um, event happens with E7 and the retinoblastoma gene. Uh, and the argument is that if you take, so if you have overexpression of E6 and E7, you take out two major tumor suppressor genes and then you're well off to getting a cancer. So obviously, there's an awful lot of um, data that we uh, use in the head and neck, extrapolate in the head and neck, which has actually come from cervix cancer data, because they're way ahead of us and the disease has been around. But they're very, very different outcomes in cervix cancer, and if not only from the genotype. So, um, and you'll be aware of this, one of the things that was taken is that the circular, de de the circular genome of the HPV DNA, when it got into the basal cells of the mucosa of the tonsillar crypts, the simple story was that there was an integration event um, that actually disrupted E2 that allowed overexpression of E6 and E7 to allow that um, then to uh, then abrogate the effects of P53 and retinoblastoma. So that was really simple. The problem that we had is that when we looked at those basal cells, integration events didn't appear to be the major effect in every instance that the DNA remained in episomal form. So there's two questions that immediately come out of that, is why does it remain in episomal form? And why does it then transform? So the next part of that story was, and we thought this amongst uh, others, is that it could be that E2 has an epigenetic um, transformation, if you like, where E2 is abrogated by epigenetic methylation effects, and therefore E6 and E7 is overexpressed, and we get off down that cascade. And that proved highly negative. There was no evidence 
of ubiquitous uh, methylation of E2 in that context and then E6 and E7. My own view, and it's the reason that I'm really so keen, we've got some data coming off that's yet to be published, but there's some evidence even from the genomic sequencing data that's what's happening in that non-coding region is actually highly, highly informative to, to what's actually happening in the over thing. And that's going to be not just um, mutational events, that's actually going to be an epigenetic event. So I think that's the next layer to take off as well. Uh, but yeah, another layer of complexity. Thanks, thanks. Can you please clarify when you were talking about personalized medicine, uh, personalized treatment, um, after transcriptomic, that point was not very clear. So uh, once you have taken the biopsy of the tissue, you have done the transcriptomics, and you have seen the mutations, and so how do you go about from there? To be determined is the answer. I mean, if, if, you, if you take into it, and I don't know anything about this, by the way, but if you take breast, you know, the molecular information that you use to d d direct breast cancer treatment at the minute, it's moved so much in the last whatever no, it might no, I, be. I understood that. The, the problem is uh, when you go for personalized treatment, uh, first of all, uh, the limitation comes as the testing and the cost, and then, uh, you know, treating the patient um, uh, and, and with that particular specific treatment. Oh, how do we practically do it? Yes, the point. so that, that's, uh, you know, the question, especially in developing countries, you can't just... I mean, keep doing uh, transcriptomic studies in right. every patient and then give the treatment based on that. No, I think that's correct. But I think that's an evolution. So at the moment, we're doing transcriptomic studies and a whole genome sequencing because we don't know what's going on. What you'd anticipate and hope is that when the answers are known, you get single gene targeting uh, events, which would be far cheaper and easier to roll out, for example. But one of the things that's also is when you get um, into thinking about resources, um, you know, the, the general trend is, or the general thoughts are that how can we add things in and how can we add more expensive things in and more um you, you know off uh, pioneering things actually in head and neck cancer you might get a personalized approach that says don't do something actually do not do that treatment and do something else and i think that's just as important as let's do something you could actually have um, a genetic profile that says actually this patient is going to do appallingly badly if you give them chemo radiotherapy, cisplatin based chemo radiotherapy. So do surgery. Or the opposite is, is actually this patient will do extremely well if they have cisplatin based chemo radiotherapy. So do that. So I think it, it doesn't always, in my brain, come down to we're doing this because we're going to have some massive magic drug. You know, the stuff I spoke to you about the personalized vaccine is a little bit off the wall and, and a bit pioneering, and I don't expect that to be rolled out anytime soon. But the simple discussions of being faced with the patient in clinic, chemo radiotherapy, surgery, surgery, radiotherapy, I don't have the answers to any of these things. We're just at the moment taking a tumor that looks E and N and something, and we're saying that patient therefore has this treatment because we only talk about it in 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 patient groups rather than being personalised. So I think it could be a cheap approach actually. Overall, it is, yes. yes. So does Nice have any approved genomic medicine protocols? I mean, barring the standard HER2 new and that variety, but anything new targets coming out in head and neck cancer? Ah, good. Um, so, so this is a little bit detailed, but that test directory that I actually showed you about, so that's, that's essentially had nice input in shape. So the idea was that the UK was going towards genetic medicine, and this test directory was published. And um, where, as head of a GSIP, when this was being developed, they came to us and they said, um, tell us all the genetic mutations you'd want to look at in head and neck. That would be really helpful to you. So we sat around a table and we decided that there actually wasn't one because we didn't actually know what to do with it. So we actually, as you do in these situations, we made up a list um, with about 100 things on it, totally expecting that they would all come back and say, well, you've got no evidence for that, so you can't do it. In fact, and I was totally shocked, they came back and gave us a panel of six things that we can do on it, which you... 
the point is that none of them influence your treatment decision. Not at all, none. So that's what I would no. say. And, and that's the folly of the situation. So they, they, they've, they've said this thing that you can do these, so I could get them funded tomorrow. I wouldn't have one idea about why I might get doing them tomorrow because they're not going to influence treatment. I mean, in truth, we're not actually at the place where we can influence treatment, despite what I told you, on HPV positive and HPV negative. There's data to not do that, and it gets a little bit here, but the 10 and 8 uh, has been republished with HPV positive extra capsular extension in there. And I would disagree with that because that's actually all based on retrospective data, and they've said that this could be prognostic. And whilst it might be prognostic, we know that in, in average units, patients will be basing decisions on it. So you could actually have a patient who is P16 positive, because it, it's not demanded that you, that you test for HPV DNA, have two lymph nodes in their neck with extra nodal extension, and they would have a high risk of being HPV negative disease, and yet that algorithm says that that's safe to de-intensify, and it would be totally the wrong thing to do. So, so what in your experience is the uh, frequency of germline mutations in, in head and neck cancers? Vanishingly small. Um, so we looked at that, but colleagues of mine looked at it a little bit, because the obvious one would be a Fanconi anemia pathway disruption in patients, in young patients who are, turn, young patients who are turning up with um, non-smoking related oral cavity cancer, particularly young women, which you see uh, very occasionally. And so we got a cohort of patients to look for Fanconi pathway disruptions, and, and, and they didn't exist. So, so I think... Um, that's the only one that came to mind to us, and and um, I don't know if you, you're aware of any, but, but but I don't think there are any definitive ones that would give you that that um, for, for squamous cell carcinoma. So thank you, Professor Jones, eliminating thought-provoking discussion, which obviously has gone only halfway. Uh, but uh, with the permission of the dean and the dean research, may we conclude formal decisions and move on to coffee and perhaps some more informal discussions. Thank you so much for, for um, hosting me and, and for listening to the talk. Thank you. <laughs>